I was not even in Congress when the funding was secured for that building. Miami Congresswoman Frederica Wilson in a war of words with the White House, how will it end? She sat down and we were stunned. Stunned that she'd done it. Stinging criticism of Representative Wilson from Chief of Staff John Kelly, but he got his facts wrong and a videotape proves it. Ocean Drive on South Beach, known throughout the world for a place to have a good time, but have the good times there gone too far? We will hear the pros and cons on a booze curfew. Good morning, glad you could join us. Glenna is off today. It has been another frantic week, a week of taunts, insults, and accusations at and from the White House, and South Florida is at the center of it. Chief of Staff John Kelly accused Miami Congresswoman Frederica Wilson of grandstanding at the dedication of a new FBI building here two years ago. And he blasted her for using the occasion to supposedly take credit for the money to build that facility. But a videotape from the Sun Sentinel showed Kelly's claims were just flat out false. When South Florida's new FBI headquarters was dedicated three years ago, Representative Wilson was a featured speaker because she fast-tracked a naming bill through Congress. Yes, she did a bit of bragging, but Wilson spent most of her speech praising the FBI and slaying agents Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove for whom the building is named. And a congresswoman uh, stood up and in the long tradition, of empty barrels making the most noise, stood up there and all of that and talked about how she was instrumental in getting the funding for that building. But the Sun Sentinel tape of Wilson's speech shows she made no such claim. Congresswoman, we've seen the video at the dedication ceremony at the FBI building. It vindicates you. Yes, it does. You did not make any claims on that day about getting the funding for the building, Mr. Kelly said you did. I was not even in Congress when the funding was secured for that building. I was a member of the Florida Senate. Wilson says she doesn't want or expect an apology from John Kelly, and certainly not from President Trump, who tweeted that she is a wacko congresswoman. I've been in this game a long time. I have very thick skin, uh, and that's just like water over the bridge as far as I'm concerned. But it's not over at the White House. On Friday, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said Kelly stands by his story and won't be answering reporters' questions. If you want to get into a debate with a four-star Marine general, I think that that's uh, something highly inappropriate. And we will talk about that comment and the furor over the president's condolence call when we sit down with the roundtable. But next, a live debate on the ballot proposal to stop serving drinks on Ocean Drive at 2 a.m. In a little more than two weeks, voters on Miami Beach are going to decide what kind of a place they want Ocean Drive to be. It is, of course, one of the most famous streets in the world, known as Party Central for people who like to eat and drink late into the night and early into the morning. Right now, drinks can be served on Ocean Drive until 5 a.m., and that produces a lot of tax revenue for the city, but problems for some Miami Beach residents who think Ocean, Gr Ocean Drive, its crowd, is too rowdy, too loud, and often too drunk. So there is a question on the November 7th ballot that asks, if last call and Ocean Drive should be 2 a.m. Ricky Ariola is a Miami Beach commissioner. He is the chief proponent of the 2 a.m. curfew on drinks being served on Ocean Drive. Jess Wallach is the chief operating officer at Mango's Tropical Cafe, a mainstay on Ocean Drive. He also has served as vice chairman of the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. Mango's, as I say, has been a mainstay. I've enjoyed going to Mango's on occasion, but uh, Ricky Ariola, let me begin with you, if I may. What's the purpose of this ordinance? What would it accomplish? Well, first of all, good morning, Michael, and good morning, Josh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys to talk about this subject. 
Look, the purpose of this uh, 2 a.m. rollback uh, and putting it on the ballot for Miami Beach voters to decide is simply that Ocean Drive has gotten out of control and has been out of control for many years now. And try as we might, we have not been able to contain the problem sufficiently to the uh, to the liking of our residents is, and, and our business me, community. Is, is, is the crime out of control? Is safety out of control? What's out of control? So what, what's driving this ballot initiative is to try to curb uh, the crime that's occurring on Ocean Drive and in the entertainment district. Uh, we have had a number of high profile uh, <clears throat> violent crimes and shootings on Ocean Drive uh, and until we get it contained we're not going to rest um, trying to to get things under control. All right and Josh Wallach what what from your point of view and you're speaking for the Ocean Drive Association uh, why shouldn't this be passed? What would it not accomplish? Well, this uh, particular ballot initiative does nothing to address crime. All it does is it shuts down three businesses on Ocean Drive. Two of them are the most iconic and famous, not only in the city of Miami Beach, yeah. but in the world. Clevelander. The and Clevelander and Mangoes, mm -hmm. and one other club. Then you have every other venue, all through Collins Avenue, Washington mm -hmm. Avenue, Espanola Way, south of 5th. They all can stay open until 5 a.m. So how is mm -hmm. this particular initiative which only targets three businesses going to address crime. Well, it, it targets, if I'm correct, I think, from 5th to 10th uh, streets on Ocean Drive, does it not? Yes, it does, Michael, but none of those businesses from 5th to 15th are or open. 15th Street. They're right. open. None of them are open past 12. Only these cafes and restaurants aren't open. The only venues that are opened are the three main nightclubs that are the entertainment of the nightlife in Miami Beach. Yeah, and Commissioner, it sounds like, well, we hear Josh Wallach saying you're targeting just three clubs. Is that what you're doing? No, we're not targeting three clubs. What we're targeting is uh, a 10 block area from 5th to 15th on Ocean Drive. There's 55 different businesses there. Um, and you have to ask yourself, why is it that so many people are congregating uh, into the wee hours of the morning on Ocean Drive and participating in criminal-like behavior. Something is attracting those folks to Ocean Drive. We've thrown enormous police resources at this problem right. to basically protect the profits of a handful of businesses. And we're going to let the voters decide uh, November 7th on whether they want to continue making that kind of investment to protect the profits yeah. of a handful of nightclubs. Uh, there is, Commissioner, a very, I think, well-written letter to the editor today's Miami Herald by a gentleman who lives on the north end of Ocean Drive and he says, look, the answer is not closing down drinks on Ocean Drive at 2 a.m. It's better code enforcement, better policing, uh, get rid of the, uh, uh, the garbage containers that are overflowing, just better management of yeah. Ocean Drive. So I authored uh, something called the 10 point plan that was unanimously approved by the commission. Uh, just this past year. And that 10-point plan had a litany of steps that we all took and we worked in partnership with the Ocean Drive businesses to try to put together a comprehensive plan to curb the criminal-like behavior that's happening on Ocean Drive. What has happened in the interim is the lobbyists of these businesses have come back and started clawing back all of those items on the 10-point plan. So we can't get uh, control over Ocean Drive because the business interests yeah. are lobbying commissioners and, and we just cannot get control over this thing. So the 2 a.m. is a way for the voters to decide, take it out of the hands of the commissioners because the commissioners get, get a tremendous amount of money from, from these businesses and let the voters decide on what they want that street to look All like. All right, Josh Wallach, there was, is this 10 point plan. Didn't the Ocean Drive Association get behind it and say, yes, we're going to work with the city? Not only did the Ocean Drive Association get behind it, but the 10 point plan had resident support. It had support of all these different areas of the city the businesses, the activists, the residents, the police. Everybody was involved. Commissioner Ariola was the author of the 10 point plan, right. and I actually mentioned to Commissioner Ariola about eight months ago that this was the single most important piece of legislation that had come down on South Beach since Tony Goldman was alive. Well, and is I, it working? It, well, what happened was it was working, and I have a, uh, a report from that Ricky sent out, the Ricky report, from dated March 28th that said that everything was going so well and all the businesses on Ocean Drive were, were doing an exemplary job in following the 10-point plan. And what happened was the Memorial Day weekend fiasco with Commissioner Greco coming back and having a press conference, then Mayor Levine having another press conference, and it all got 
thrown into a political storm and we were thrown back into the crosshairs. And what, what is so un, un, uh, really just hurtful to all of us that put so much time, effort and money and over $2 million and almost a year invested into the 10 point plan, which was a, bi a, a, a bridge to a business improvement district for South Beach, yeah. which, which is the future of South Beach. Okay, just like yeah. Wynwood has and, and, and Lincoln Road has. And that 10 point plan was just discarded. Well, what about like, the lobbyists? Commissioner Ariola says, yeah, well, they signed onto it, but then they sent their lobbyists over to sort of knock out the tougher provisions. Well, let me tell you something. The 10 point plan had so many, it was one concession after another. Commissioner Ariola. Yeah, but you I, signed on to it. We did. And so did, and so it was, it received not only a unit, it was, it received Mayor Levine's vote. It was a comprehensive plan that would cover, and you know everything good takes time. When you have, when you have a, 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 a football team that's losing, if you want to get to the Super Bowl, yeah, it takes, time it takes to time. turn things around. It that's takes time true. to turn things around. We were well on our way. And then what happened was this Memorial Day fiasco, and, and now it became a gigantic political firestorm co concerning Commissioner Grieco, concerning Mayor Levine, yeah. and concerning Commissioner Ariola, all getting in, and we were thrown right back into the crosshairs, and this 10-point plan was just thrown to the side like it never even existed. Um, Commissioner, um, I, I think the fact of the matter is that uh, Local 10 News, other media here have covered ad nauseum many, many terrible incidents that have happened on or near Ocean Drive. I mean, there was this incident just a, a few days ago where this woman and a partner, a friend had been drinking. She got into a car, uh, hit a couple of other cars, then ran down a, a Miami Beach police officer and was shot to death. And I, I mean, what could be more awful yeah. than this incident? Now, is that sort of emblematic of the problems that you see? That's, that's exactly right, uh, Michael, is, is that uh, try as we might, uh, these problems continue, and Miami Beach voters are getting tired of it. Uh, and we have always said, even despite the 10-point plan, that a 2 a.m. rollback was still on the table and would always be on the table. Uh, uh, the, the time in which the 10-point plan has been implemented, we're seeing clawbacks. Like every meeting, we have lobbyists coming in and clawing back everything we're trying to do with the 10-point plan. And so it puts us in a really uncomfortable position where residents are demanding action, we keep seeing these high-profile violent crimes. We had a police officer injured. Fortunately, he's okay. But yeah. you know, what, what, we, what would we tell right. his family when, if it was more uh, severe? I, I understand. I want to come back. I want to get your reaction to handling crime on Ocean Drive and South Beach. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back. We are in the middle of a debate over Ocean Drive and whether booze should be stopped uh, serving booze there at 2 a.m., which is the proposal of Commissioner Ricky Ariola and supported by Mayor Phil Levine. He uh, was invited. He is not here this morning. And uh, Josh, uh, you heard the commissioner talk about the crime. And when you get this many people, they're going to be, there's going to be some crime. Sure. But we have seen some really extraordinarily violent and awful crimes occur either on Ocean Drive or nearby. I mean, uh, you run a legitimate fine business there. Yes. Uh, you don't encourage crime, but you know, you look, in fact, I wonder, you see the woman who was driving the car that hit the cop. Yes. Uh, whoever the bartender was who was serving her, don't you think at some point the bartender might have said if the woman was pretty obviously in, inebriated right. that he should have stopped serving? Well, you know, that was the middle of the day. And actually, police statistics that we have show that most of the crime happening in Miami Beach is between 4 and 6 p.m. Actually, after 2 a.m., uh, police calls drop 35 percent. And 97 percent of all crime in the city of Miami Beach, violent crime, is not on Ocean Drive. Much of it is on Collins Avenue. Mm -hmm. So there's n th shutting down mangoes and the clevelander which have the iconic status uh, uh for for our city of prime 112 and joe stone crabs and these other types of places this is going to to not even move the needle a tenth of one percent on crime community policing uh getting our off duties back we haven't had off-duty officers michael since 2014. why not 
because after uh, Mayor Levine came into power, there was an incident on Ocean Drive yeah. with a police officer who was having personal issues. His department should have known he had personal issues, and he had a, a bad night this working. Where he was drinking on the job well, but, off duty. But, the, but, the, but as a police officer and as a sergeant, you know, his, his team should have known that he was having some issues. But well, the point, Anyway, the cops, Miami Beach Police, don't want to work off duty now on Ocean No, Drive absolutely. Uh, we had, we've had off duty officers for over 20 years. And when, sometimes when you see in these videos that are out there, two people having a little bit of an altercation, you know what happened? I spent 20 years on Ocean Drive, standing right there in the street. Two people would get into something, and up would walk the off-duty officer, get in the middle of it. Oh, you go, you go, you go. And it dissipated like nothing. Yeah. Now, with no Johnny-on-the-spot police officer, these things are allowed to escalate. Like I said, just like right. at a well, Dolphin hold game. On. Uh, Commissioner, I happen to think that com uh, Police Chief Dan Oates has done a good job over there with the department. But, I mean, here you're hearing Josh Wallach say... The police are not doing well, their job so, now, off-duty or on. Yeah, well, so first of all, uh, Chief Dan Oates has done a fabulous job, okay? Uh, and to refute some of what Josh said, first of all, 87% of violent crimes uh, uh, arrests have occurred on Ocean Drive. And the officer he was talking about was drinking at his establishment. His bartenders were giving him the drinks while the officer was in uniform. So it's disingenuous for Josh to come in here and say stuff like that, okay? So uh, on behalf of the police department, you know, I, uh, I, you know I'm offended that you, these allegations are being uh, leveled against them. They're doing a great job. They're doing the very best they can. We have uh, added uh, an additional shift to Ocean, specifically just for Ocean Drive, is costing taxpayers an additional million dollars a year. Uh, I was an economics major in college. There's something called externalities. And an externality is when a third party, in this case society, bears the cost of the actions of an unrelated party. So imagine a, uh, a, a plant that pollutes into a river. The, com the community, the society, has to clean up the river while the plant enjoys all and, the profits. And you're saying and Ocean in the case Drive of mangoes is the polluter? And other businesses, they make lots of money, and then society, the citizens of yeah. Miami Beach, have to clean up the mess. All and right. we're, we're paying a heavy price for this. I mean, if, if you want to talk about disingenuous, okay, everything that Commissioner Ariola just said was uh, a, a spun-up fallacy in order to make us look we, we have been on the beach. My grandfather bought that building in 1955. My grandmother folded towels on Ocean Drive when there was nobody there. We've been there since the 50s. We, this is our city. We love the city very, very much. And we have been in every single era of this city, every single era. And uh, to, in order to be demonized for, for trying to do our jobs as small business people right. and well, job I don't, creators. I, 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 I heard the criticism. I don't think he's trying to demonize you. Uh, Commissioner, I, I do need to ask this question, which uh, Josh brought up earlier, and that is uh, bars south of Fifth Street and over on Washington and Collins, even if voters approve this uh, 2 a.m. curfew, they're going to be serving booze, their liquor stores selling uh, liquor uh, until the early morning hours. I mean, if somebody wants to drink outside or any place after 2 a.m., they could drink inside in a closed space on Ocean Drive or just simply go over to Collins or Washington. So are you not discriminating against these establishments? No, so Ocean Drive is unique, right? The configuration of Ocean Drive itself, uh, there's a critical mass of bars and restaurants, 55 of them, in fact, in that 10 block radius. Uh, it spills out into a park and into a street that's very popular for folks to come cruising along uh, in, in, uh, in their cars. So it is very conducive to a, the carnival-like atmosphere that's created on Ocean Drive by establishments that are open-air cabarets. Uh, and so that it is what it is. It's like a Bourbon Street, okay? It's just the configuration of Ocean Drive lends itself to that kind of activity. Uh, you go into Collins, Washington, south of Fifth, you, you just don't have that kind of street configuration. So we're not targeting specific businesses. We're, we're targeting a specific area of Miami Beach where the, yeah. that is laden with crime. And, and just you, in about 20 seconds, you feel, in fact, that since these other places can serve booze until 5 a.m., that it's discriminatory. Th th they don't. They're closed by, their restaurants closed by 12 or 1 o'clock. The only places that are opened that are being targeted with this referendum are Mango's, the Clevelander, and Ocean's. It's three businesses. If you think that closing 
these three entertainment venues for all of our tourists is going to deter crime, I have a bridge to sell you, okay? <laughs> all right, well, I don't know who's buying, but we'll see what voters say on November 7th. Commissioner Ariola, thank you for coming in. Josh Wallach, thank, thank you. you very much. Say hello to your dad for me. Thank you very much. All right, up next, we're gonna take it all to the round table. All right, it is time now for a closer, more analytical look at the week's top news stories with our powerhouse roundtable. Round table, and we've got a great one for you. Ed Pizzoli is president of the Tripscott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale, an influential voice in the Republican Party in South Florida and also in Washington. Andrea Robinson is a veteran South Florida journalist, a reporter with the Miami Times, formerly with the Miami Herald. Mike Abrams is a former state legislator, former head of the Miami-Dade Democratic Party, and now a partner at Ballard Partners, a lobbying firm headquartered in Tallahassee, recently opened an office in <coughs> Washington. Mike, Andrea, Ed, great to have you come in. Great Andrea, to be back. good morning. Good. Did, um, did this condolence call that the president made to uh, Maisha Johnson, was it insensitive? Was it disrespectful? the words themselves, and I'm speaking as a former military wife, my husband was in the Air Force. Hmm. The words themselves, people hear that, soldier to soldier, your commanding officer to his people under him, but the words, first of all, no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear he that. He knew what he was signing he up for, even though it hurts Exactly. I think that the way, as I understand this transpired, General Kelly told him or shared a story. Right. The thing is, is that Donald Trump has the vocabulary of a five-year-old. Well, no, maybe an eight-year-old. He does not process words and meaning, has no empathy. So for him to say that, it's not going to come out the way it was intended. And that's what I suspect happened. Mike Abrams, uh, do you think, in fact, that the president was disrespectful in this phone call? I mean, after all, General Kelly said in that remarkable Thursday briefing, I told him he really didn't, shouldn't call these four families, but the president wanted to. I mean, it appears he wanted to be comforting, but he may well, not I'm have been. I'm sure his intentions were good, but as usual, uh, his words could be egregious and he could be insensitive. But what bothers me about this is this was at best a one-day story. And what we keep doing with President Trump and what the media, frankly, keeps doing is dragging these stories out that for four, five, six days. In this case, it does Sergeant Johnson an injustice because mm -hmm. nowheres during the week, I shouldn't say nowheres, but where did anybody raise the question what was Sergeant Johnson doing in Niger? What were American troops well, doing I, in I, Niger? But I think that's, co I think that's yeah. coming. Uh, that is coming out well, now. Come we on. Are that asking should have been about, the first question. Well, well, it, well it, I don't, it, I don't it, know if it was it, the first question, but people have, have to get yeah. over this death, especially here in South Florida. This is a local so uh, soldier, uh, and so, so it, that it, for us, that Ed, Ed, jump in. If you, uh, I'm really against this whole politics around this. This is whether it's Donald Trump or whether it's a Congressman, Congresswoman Wilson. I mean, she's had her 10 minutes of fame. It's now her time to step off the stage on this issue because in the end, a family lost a son, uh, a, a wife lost a husband, and uh, two kids and one on the way lost their father. And so if you really want to do something, then go to the GoFund account yeah. and help fund uh, help with that family because he did give the ultimate sacrifice and none of us uh, at least I can't speak to the loss uh, of, of, of a family member who in the process of serving our country so let's respect that that's where we lose the personal piece of this around the politics back and forth and honestly I, we got to move on I agree with Mike on this point uh, the issue really is let's talk let's have a real debate around policy about what the, is that the appropriate use of our military? Uh, why are we there? What are we doing? What is the end game? How, why, you know, all of those things yeah. about how we're using that. And all of that's obscured by, by frankly, uh, you know, uh, whether what he said was insensitive in a true intention to try but to comfort that, that family. Congresswoman Wilson, to her credit, she did 
issue a statement calling for an investigation of what happened yeah. in Niger. And yeah. so that has not that has not been lost. Maybe not to the extent you want it to, but that yeah. has not been lost. And also, I've got to say, when I spoke with her at her home on Friday, she said, I'm finished with this. We've got to grieve over the loss of this American hero. And I'm not going to continue this. But Mike, to your point earlier, uh, when she said that, and we put it on the air, um, the president still sent out this tweet in which he called her a wacko congresswoman. So if the president is tweeting and calling a member of Congress from our community a wacko, we're going to report that. But, Mike, that's, excuse me, with all due respect, that's where the media goes wrong, oh, in, in, my, in my judgment. Yeah. Because the media is belaboring, at this point, a non-issue. You know, when there are so many other significant issues surrounding, uh, in this instance, Sergeant Johnson's presence in, in Nigeria. You know, we, the president, he, he's, this is where he's a master, you know, where, where he throws out these buzzwords and we all get distracted from really the important issues of the day. I'll give you another example. When we had the hurricane, uh, and there were all these issues surrounding hurricane relief. All of a sudden, he attacks the NFL players, and everybody's talking about the NFL players. Well, he is, he, you know, he is a master at that, but Ed Pizzoli, I, I, I need to say, part of the reason this story went on was, of course, this remarkable press conference that General John Kelly, Chief of Staff John Kelly, gave on Thursday, where he talked about the loss of his own son, mm -hmm. heartbreaking, mm -hmm. and how the bodies of dead soldiers are handled. Uh, I mean, it was just riveting stuff. But then It puts a certain context to it, doesn't it? Well, of course, it yeah. does. Then, however, he went on to say at the dedication of the FBI building in 2015 in Miramar that he heard uh, Congresswoman Wilson bragging about getting $20 million from President Obama, and thanks to the Sun Sentinel, which published the video, she didn't say anything yeah. like that. With, with all due respect to what you just said to me, Congressman Wilson is enjoying the a sudden notoriety, and and frankly, uh, I find that appalling. How can you and so say that? I, I I just did because because every time she's interviewed about this, it, you know, she is enjoying the spotlight. But putting that aside, I think we've got to refocus back on two things. One, the personal loss, and so I would ask. You know, anybody watching this, go to the GoFund and go support those, well, those they, children. One, two, is let's have a bigger question. And Congresswoman Wilson's go, office go, set up the GoFund. That's fine. Then, then to that, I give her credit for. On the, on the second piece, I do think there's a bigger discussion around policy, about why we're there and what we're doing there. And those questions are legitimate policy discussions, and we may have legitimate uh, answers around that. But to Mike's point, I actually do think that there is a conflict there's a need to report conflict at every turn, even though well, the we issue in the media, is meaningless. As you know, we in the media thrive on conflict. Absolutely. It is our middle name. And but sometimes when there are, there's plenty of conflict around, we, Mike. Well, there's plenty of conflict around that has real meat to the bone. Well, I mean, that's that's when, when you don't like the meat, that's when you want to no, no, focus no, on no, something no, else. No, I'm willing to, I'm right, willing to Ed, debate Ed, uh, look, where your, what the your, role is. Your points are salient, but I've got to say, come back to the fact that uh, John Kelly simply didn't tell the truth about what happened. Oh, oh, and please. the Herald today has an excellent editorial in which he I'm, says, just call her up and say, you know, on that you point, Congresswoman, I'm I don't know, sorry. I don't know if he misspoke or not. What I would say is, he did. I, I would say he it did. this way. No one on this table has experienced what John Kelly has, and I stand with him w relative to what he explained to the press, because it was about time someone actually gave a context about what happens and, and when a body what? comes back and a family has to deal with actual and grief. And, and he was the fine. one person he who could explain that. that anecdote at that instead of creating this <clears> story that was easily proven to be false. He should have left it at that. He was the person who was supposed to have come into the White House to bring right. some humanity to he, Donald he, Trump. I don't think it, and, I don't think and, it, and, and it wasn't and, humanity. And it was organization. What, what, well, you know, Discipline. But, but the thing is, Discipline. his example, given that story, which is a, a lie, we don't want to say that word, but a lie, no. it turns out he's now being seen in the same light would, as Donald Trump. I'm, I'm not going to get faded into we, the we've, political we've conversation. We've kind of exhausted this up the to the point. I would like to point out that the great people of South Florida 
have already contributed nearly seven hundred thousand yep. dollars to mm -hmm. the GoFundMe account for Maisha Johnson, her two Fantastic. children, and the daughter yes. who is going to be born, and more Fantastic. power to them. And also those pictures yesterday of hundreds of people lining mm -hmm. the roadside, saluting, put their hands over their hearts as the hearse went by. I found that very, very moving. It was very touching. Yeah. Very well, touching there, there have actually been a lot of touching events that have gone on this week, um, you know, such as such as the one in Gainesville, where I think we saw a great reaction from the students and a great reaction from the citizens and, and, and in terms of uh, Richard Spencer's appearance. And, uh, right. All right. right, well, let's take a break. We're going to come mm -hmm. back and talk about this white supremacist who tried to stir things up in Gainesville this week, and it didn't really work. Stay with us. We are in the midst of a really interesting roundtable, and before we get to Richard Spencer and this speech that he tried to give at the University of Florida this week, um, I want to bring up this comment that Sarah Sanders, the press secretary, made on Friday when she was asked by reporters, uh, will General Kelly come out? Will he answer some questions about the allegations he made about Frederica Wilson? And she said, do you really want to get into a debate with a four-star Marine general? That would be inappropriate. Uh, Mike Abrams, uh, the fact of the matter is that people in positions of public trust are answerable, and they're answerable to the public through the media. Well, that's right. Uh, and they, we have every right to hold them accountable. And just because they might have the title general in front of them uh, shouldn't mitigate that. And also, by the way, not that she would know this, but we do have civilian control of government in this country. Well, this country was right. not meant to be run by generals. And in one sense, it's a commentary, commentary on President Trump that everybody says, well, thank God we got a few generals in the room. You know, I mean, generals have gotten us in trouble, by the way, sometimes also. So, exactly. No, but, the point, you know, but the but, point is not whether or not the generals. The point is that John Kelly does bring a certain uh, discipline to the White yes, House. Yes, of course. He's he also, of course. He is, but he also I mean, brings a certain, as reporters, ahead. though, how is someone going to tell us how to do our jobs or what the well, parameters in which we're well, supposed to work? Well, she can say that, but reporters are not going to follow Nobody's going to follow what her, she's saying, no. Her orders, that, that is true. Pol I people so in the political, political you world even, say that all the time. Yeah, I mean, you do, but, but does it but make it... press doesn't... We, you know, are we going to listen to you? Mean, with Republicans, no. no. You're always on attack. We, no, we, we attack don't know how everybody. to obey, okay. Ed. That's, no, exactly. That's the, that's we're the not problem. You know, we We are. Also, I want to point out this morning on this week with... Uh, uh, George Stephanopoulos, uh, Martha was doing this show this morning, General David Petraeus said, of course, he's got an obligation to answer questions. So, all right, well, let's look at this Richard Spencer speech at the University of Florida, uh, which was touted as this big moment. And uh, it turned out to be all wind up and no delivery yet. I mean, uh, I thought the students really handled themselves well. So there are three points I want to make. First uh, is Mike's point that, again, this is a media swing at the most fringe aspect of our society because no one on this panel would ever agree with anything Richard Spencer has to say. However, there are a couple of points I really do want to make. I'm really proud of the University of Florida. This is coming from a hurricane. All right, so I'm really proud. I'm also proud of the state government that prepared for this and handled it and basically made it a non-event. Okay, because I do support, the one thing I do support is Spencer's right to speak under the First Amendment. As, as despicable as what he says, mm -hmm. I do support his right to speak. The state handled it much differently, our state did, than, Virginia. than say Virginia or, or California, where at it Berkeley. was out of control yeah. at Berkeley, right? Yeah. And so the difference between how you handle and manage the situation depends upon your leadership. So the University of Florida and state government, Rick Scott, frankly, uh, all get kudos on that front to make it essentially a non-event. Okay, but the $500,000 price tag for, who's gonna pay that? We are, and isn't and that the price of democracy? I mean, I, I happen to agree entirely with Ed. This despicable guy has a First Amendment right just as we do to sit here and But I see, know, I don't understand, comment. because hate speech is not protected. 
to the, it, it should mm -hmm. not be. Should no. no I, I. Well, let's ask the lawyer in the group here. No, right? I actually think that um, the fact that it makes our blood boil, right? The, the very fact that what somebody says makes our blood boil, whether it's on the left, right, or whatever it is, is precisely the purpose of the First Amendment. And it should be also uh, the purpose of a university for a robust, well, robust discussion agreed. of many points of view. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Look, uh, we, I think we both cut our teeth in the 60s in the free speech movement on campuses. Yeah, yeah. I in lived the in 60s. Berkeley as a kid. And, and the great irony <laughs> is Berkeley, Berkeley we, we, is now denying speech, certain right, rights. Free free. Deny, look, uh, I, I think any time you shine a light on, on people like Spencer, uh, you know, people will make sensible judgments but again, about what he's saying. If, it, well, each time you know, he or someone of his ill comes and wants to do a speech, we're going to call. We're going to okay. spend five hundred thousand. So let's go at, through this exercise, Richard Spencer. We agree. We we don't like his speech, so we yeah. shouldn't let him speak. All right, Ann Coulter, you don't like what she says. We're eh, not spending I could take her. I could take her leave her. But the bottom line is, no, no, hang on. That was one of the arguments being made about why she had to cancel her events. Do you, do you not let her speak? Let's talk about some of the left. Do you think that some of the people on the left, I mean, frankly, could, should should be denied the opportunity to speak? You know, communists, you know, socialists, those fascists, all those people, well, should they be allowed you know, to speak? Suspect, so where do we draw the line? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, yes. they should be allowed to That's speak. That's why you cannot go down that line and deny and call somebody's speech hate speech because then right. who decides? They would have said this but, 50 but years sucks. ago about Martin Luther King being That's able correct. to speak at the University That's, of Alabama. That's right. Or not They could have used the same excuses. Correct. As but and, now, and those people, and, and that's precisely the reason why the First Amendment is So everybody there. in Florida, in Florida, because Spencer has gone on to Ohio, and the Ohio State has told him no, again. And I don't think he's going to be able to speak there. Anytime someone comes here, they're going to be allowed to speak, and we're going to be up Well, the, the courts, middle. but the courts, I mean, when he tried to speak, uh, I think Spencer tried to speak uh, in Alabama, and the courts simply said to whatever school that was, I forget, uh, You've got to allow them to speak. Right. Florida, the University of Florida, state of Florida, would have been liable to a big judgment if he couldn't have. Before we run out of time, I have to ask uh, all of you, I thought George W. Bush gave a remarkable speech late this week in which he <laughs> took, not by name, but he said the great traditions of liberty, democracy, uh, civility in this country are being trampled. He didn't say the word the name Donald Trump, but it was pretty clear who he was talking about. Yeah. And, you and, hear that speech? Oh yeah, I did, and and I was grateful to President Bush for for it. And I and I think uh, you know ever since he left the presidency, uh, he's you know he's acted with class and dignity, and and he's allowed his two successes to operate without the shadow of his. Right. Well, remarks. he was quiet basically and, and, for eight right. years. That's yeah. right, but uh, but but the point is that uh, the level of civil discourse or the d decline of civil discourse is one of the central issues in this country. We have to take coarseness out of, out of our daily language. Well, I think we could agree. Or try. Uh, we could disagree without being disagreeable. We have to have legitimate debates right. about, about policy. I will say this. I was surprised that President Bush came out and did it. Oh, we agree uh, on something. No, wow. I was totally wow. surprised. <laughs> and, and what he said, uh, 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 the exact words I listened to the speech were fine. However, the timing of the speech and given the history that he has been silent for uh, eight or nine years well, and given the, the reference he paid to both President Obama and up till that point President Trump, I, th I was surprised and frankly a little disappointed because but I, 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 look, I he has a right to speak. He came at the we, right we time could, with the right message. All right, hold on. That's the last word. Sorry, <laughs> we are out of time. Good for you, Andrea. All right, thank, thank you, you Mike. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Andrea. Still to come, my personal perspective about the death of Sergeant LaDavid Johnson and that resulting furor. And here is a live look now from our Hollywood Beach Cam. And here is Weather Authority meteorologist Jennifer Correa with your Sunday forecast. Good morning, Jen. 
Uh, good morning or good afternoon, <laughs> Michael. It's already the afternoon hours, but very early and it is still so breezy out there. Uh, so if you do want to head out to the beach, notice how everybody's on the sand. That's a good idea. Those rips are high and dangerous, so stay away from the water. Be safe out there. The winds are right now at 20 miles per hour. Miami out of the east and southeast all across South Florida. So basically 15 to 20 mile per hour wind speeds with gusts higher than that. Uh, almost 30 mile per hour wind gusts in Marathon up to 25 miles per hour across Miami-Dade County. Now temperatures are still warming up. We're hitting the mid to upper 80s all across the area right now. Eventually we're going to hit a high of 88 degrees at least for the city of Miami. A few isolated showers cannot be ruled out, but for the most part it is pretty quiet on the radar. Small craft advisory does remain in effect for parts of the Florida Straits, and then that high risk of rip currents will also remain in effect through the rest of today. See anywhere between three to five feet, occasionally up to six feet, uh, but definitely stay safe out there. Those winds are going to start to lighten up by tomorrow. It's going to become warm and humid. Highs getting close to 90 degrees with a chance for an afternoon thunderstorm because of the cold front coming our way. Now the cold front doesn't come here over us until late Tuesday uh, between the late afternoon and evening hours. When it does, it's going to bring a line of showers and cloud cover for the second half of Tuesday. The front clears out early Wednesday morning and then we're in for less humid conditions. In fact, temperatures dropping into the 60s Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Michael. Jen, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about the death of Sergeant LaDavid Johnson. He is an American hero. His death is a tragic loss for his family and for our community. So many people honored him yesterday, standing by the roadside, saluting, putting their hands over their hearts as the hearse passed by and waving American flags. Black, white veterans, regular folks who wanted to pay tribute to a brave soldier. It was a moving and gratifying sight. Even more moving was to see his widow, Maisha, lean down, kiss the casket before it was lowered into the ground. Sergeant Johnson was remembered at the services as a good man, dedicated to his family, a guy who wanted to improve himself and provide for his family. That's why he joined the Army. It's a shame that his life and his service was overshadowed this week by the furor over the president's phone call to his wife. That call in which Mr. Trump said LaDavid knew what he was signing up for, even though it still hurts, there's a truth to that. But it was not the time or place to say it. Congresswoman Wilson heard that comment because the president's call was on speakerphone. Wilson says Maisha Johnson was very upset by what the president said, that he was disrespectful, didn't even call LaDavid by his name, just called him your guy. LaDavid's aunt backed up her version of that story, and Representative Wilson was livid. She went public with it, as was her right. She was not secretly listening in, as the president said. She's an old friend of the Johnson family, and LaDavid was a product of her 5,000 Role Models of Excellence program. John Kelly accused Wilson of violating a sacred trust by talking about the president's call. That's nonsense. He was also wrong when he said that she took credit in a speech for getting money to build the new FBI headquarters in Miramar. She did not say such a thing. General Kelly, an honorable man, should call up Representative Wilson and apologize. But that's not going to happen, of course. And as for the president, he never apologizes to anyone. He has taken to calling Wilson a wacko congressman. Look, she is idiosyncratic in those sparkly hats she wears, but she has served our community for a long time and served well as a teacher, a principal, school board member, state legislator, now as a member of Congress. Frederica Wilson is no wacko, and it is beneath the office of the president to use that kind of language. We thank her for her service and for standing up for Sergeant Johnson and his family. That's my perspective. Have a great day. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. See you next Sunday.